All right, so on the board behind me, I have a couple of examples of the tools that scientists use for measuring pressures. The two main types of tools that we have are what we call a barometer, which is appropriate for measuring the pressure of the atmosphere. Perhaps you've even heard that term on the uh, local weather forecast. They talk about the barometric pressure, right? So they're saying it's coming from a barometer. Uh, and so it's commonly associated with the entire atmosphere. In the lab, if you have a sample of gas trapped or enclosed and you're studying that sample of gas, you would use a manometer instead. So let's see how these are different. A barometer is a long tube of mercury, containing mercury. And now originally it, it's prepared, although nowadays we would not use a mercury version to reduce the hazards associated with mercury, but the way you would have made an old-fashioned barometer would be to have filled the tube with mercury completely, completely filled with mercury, turn it upside down, and then let it sit in a pool of mercury at the bottom. When you do that, some of the particles of mercury would fall down because gravity is pulling on them. But nothing would take their place. So this head space above the mercury has no particles in it. And as I just described a minute ago, in a little box, there were gas particles bouncing around hitting the walls. That's where the pressure comes from. We don't have that here though. No particles, so there's no pressure up there. Down here though, on this open reservoir, this open pool, we have the entire atmosphere capable of banging into it, the gas particles bumping in, and so they are applying pressure via the force of their collisions onto the surface area of the mercury. And it's that pressure that allows some of the mercury to stay up in the column. All right. So you use the barometer simply by measuring the difference in height from the top of your reservoir to the top of the mercury in the tube. And that's what we call the atmospheric pressure, P atmosphere. And this, I, this uh, sort of picture here is where we get some of the units that we uh, see commonly. What, what you would have done with this 100 years ago is you would have had a scale that had a meter stick literally on here. And you would have measured the height of this column in meters or centimeters or maybe even millimeters. And so millimeters of mercury, MMHG, became the first commonly applied units of pressure measuring gas pressures because millimeters is about the tiniest scale that we're used to seeing on a meter stick and so you just measure how tall that column is in meter, millimeters. We've changed that over though to the atmosphere and the relationship between these is that 760 millimeters of mercury. So about three quarters of a meter to give you an idea, right? What's this? About a meter right here. So about three quarters of a meter would be the average or typical atmospheric pressure around where we live. Of course, this fluctuates from sea level to high altitudes, but around sea level, the pressure is usually around one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury. Other units of pressure, though, have become pretty prominent. One is now called the bar, and the bar and the atmosphere are pretty close to each other. 1.01325 bar, meaning barometric pressure, are equal to one atmosphere. And the bar is related to another unit called the Pascal, the same number, 1.01325, but times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So that's 101,000 Pascals equaling one bar, right? And so that's, uh, that's how tiny the Pascal is. Another way of thinking about this is it's 101 0.325 kilo pascals. So these now are relationships that you can use to convert pressures. Again, typically we would measure things in millimeters of mercury, but then maybe convert over to atmospheres. That'll be the most common conversion that you do. Nowadays, in, in his honor, in honor of a scientist, uh, Torricelli, we've actually renamed the millimeter of mercury into the tor. So they're the same thing. So 760 tor are equal to one atmosphere. So let's do a quick conversion here. Let's convert um, 475 tor to ki uh, kilopascals. So we would do 475 tor 
times, what's our relationship? In the denominator, 760 tor are equal to 101.325 kilopascals. Everything in this equality here is equal, so we can choose any two parts to make our conversion factor. And so we would need to just take our 475 divided by 760 and then multiply it by 101.325. That is 63.3 kPa's, kilopascals. All right? So the other unit of uh, measuring gas pressures is the manometer. The manometer measures the pressure of a gas relative to the pressure of the atmosphere. We take that tube essentially and it gets bent into the shape of a U. And so the liquid in the tube, still mercury, fluctuates depending on the pressure applied to each side. Uh, to me it's a lot like a seesaw. You have a seesaw that's balanced and then you put two people on it. Whichever side has the heavier or the larger person, imagine a parent playing with their child on the seesaw, that, that heavier parent is going to exert a larger force and so their side is going to go down. So as we're looking at this picture as I've drawn it here, do you see how the green is down further on the gas side? The gas is like the parent in our seesaw here. So I can tell from this picture here, for this one specifically, the gas pressure is greater than the atmosphere which is pushing down on the, the right side as we're looking at it. To find the actual pressure of the gas then, we would need a scale just like we needed in our barometer to measure the difference between the two. And so the gas's pressure is simply going to be the atmospheric pressure plus the delta P plus the difference between these two. So you would have to have a barometer handy or someone telling you the atmospheric pressure in order to be able to do this. When you have the gas pressure greater, that's when you'd use the plus sign. If the gas pressure is less, that's when you would use the minus sign over here. So you'd have to look at the picture, critically evaluate whether the pressure of the gas is greater or less than the atmosphere and then decide to add or subtract. Okay. So those are some of the tools that we use for measuring uh, gas pressures. Um, in the lab, we nowadays don't like to have as much mercury hanging around, so we have an electronic uh, digital barometer that has been calibrated um, against an authentic mercury barometer. And uh, in terms of monometers, we might use water in place of the, uh, the mercury if we could. All right. So let's talk a little bit briefly to wrap up this segment about uh, the properties of the gases. Pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. The four properties that we laid out a few minutes ago as being the fundamental properties we need to identify a, uh, a gas or understand a gas completely. We can pick any two of these properties and study a relationship between them. And that's really how our work and understanding of gases began. Scientists 300 years ago did that. They, they would try to isolate a sample of gas, maintaining its constant amount. And then also they work at a constant temperature, which allows pressure and volume to fluctuate. Okay? And what was found, this was the first gas law, it was found that pressure was inversely related to volume. So they were opposites of one another. That's what we might say. Pressure, pressure is proportional to the inverse of volume. And then in a different gas law, it was found that volume was directly related to temperature. So they behaved the same way. As one increased, the other increased. Right? This first case, as the pressure increases, the volume of a gas decreases or vice versa. But as volume increases, its temperature increases. As temperature decreases, the volume of a gas will decrease. Then we found that pressure was proportional to temperature. We found that volume was directly proportional to amount. And once we found each of these relationships individually, we were able to sort of combine them into a series of equations. And uh, the two that I'll leave you with right now are what we now call the general 
or I learned it as the combined, so sometimes we'll hear it as that, the general or combined gas law, which says that the pressure of a gas times its volume divided by its temperature at one set of conditions is equal to the pressure times the volume divided by the temperature at a separate set of conditions. Now what's constant here is N, the amount. So the amount is constant. So a great visual here is a balloon. You blow up a balloon with a gas, tie it, and then you've enclosed a certain number of particles. Now you can take that balloon and change. Change the altitude that it's at, so you're changing its pressure. Change its temperature, take it inside or outside, put it in a freezer, all right? And the volume is gonna fluctuate. So these are gonna sort of all fluctuate together, the variables that we have, all right? If we take away that constraint of N changing though, and allowing N to change, based on how N is related to volume, we end up with P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2. However, because these are the only four properties, it turns out that no matter what gas you use, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, helium, no matter what gas you use, when you figure out its pressure, volume, amount, and temperature, this is always, always equal to the exact same value, 0 0.0820.